Okay, so last class we talked about nuclear equations. We're going to kind of briefly just review a bit of those. Uh, so the first one we looked at was alpha decay, where we had an alpha particle, uh, sometimes just called a helium atom, um, just because it, it has two protons uh, and two neutrons, um, just as a helium nucleus. Uh, and the example we looked at was uranium undergoing uh, alpha decay. And what we found is uranium will give off the alpha particle, the 4 to helium here, and uh, something else. And mathematically, it has to add up, right? So you have to have 238 on the left side, and the two values on the right side have to add up to 238 as well. This is called conservation of nucleons. And then on the bottom down here, we had 92 protons. So we had to keep that conserved. That's conservation of charge. So if we had the two protons from the helium, we needed two for, or sorry, uh, 90 from the thorium to add up to 92. Okay, and that's how we found that we were dealing with thorium last class. Uh, we also took a look at beta negative decay. Uh, beta negative decay was a little weird because we talked about a beta particle. Okay, uh, usually we, we just call that an electron. Um, but one of the things is it's not actually an electron that's ejected from the, uh, the orbiting electrons. It's one that's um, converted in the process of a neutron turning into a proton um, in the nucleus, which is a little weird. And for now, we don't exactly know how that process works, uh, but we do know we get a couple things with beta negative decay. We know we get one electron ejected off, and we get uh, a different subatomic particle called an antineutrino, okay, often called an electron antineutrino. Uh, which is this one over here. So this V with a line over top. Sometimes you'll see it with the E here to remind you that it's uh, uh, an electron antineutrino. And we'll sometimes even see it with the value zero, zero. For now, um, we just know that's one of the products as well. Not a lot to it, um, but it is part of the uh, ones that are ejected with beta negative decay. So that's kind of where we stopped last class. Um, just kind of continuing a bit with that beta negative decay about that neutron. What it's doing is it's kind of decaying itself. So it's transmutating. Okay, so that's one word you'll see in uh, nuclear um, physics here is transmutation of the neutron turning into a proton and ejecting an electron and an antineutrino. Like I said, exactly how this happens we haven't gotten into yet. It's just kind of important to remember that um, this electron is not in orbit. Okay, around the uh, nucleus, it's coming from the um, uh, the nucleus itself. Uh, okay, so some new stuff here. Uh, another type of reaction is the electron capture reaction. This is when um, we look at instead of ejecting an electron, the electron is actually on the same side of whatever particle we're working with. So we're kind of capturing it, like you would capture the flag. Um, you're you're keeping it together on this. And what you're going to find is that's going to change your balanced uh, equation here. If we also look, we've got another kind of strange particle over here. This is a V without a line over top. So if the V with the line over top was the electron antineutrino, this is just the electron neutrino. Once again, it's just a subatomic particle. We have no idea what it is, okay? but it is one that we find in um, some different types of nuclear reactions. We'll get into more of this later on. So all electron capture is, is when we get a, nu uh, a nuclear proton um, changing into a neutron and at the same time uh, ejecting out a neutrino. So in this process, um, the proton now is converting into a neutron. So we've got a bit of a reverse process on this one and causing the emission of an electron neutrino. Uh, one that we will kind of see in the homework for today is the beta positive uh, decay, also called a positron emission. So positrons are the exact same things as electrons, except instead of having that negative one charge, like an electron does, whoop, it has a positive one charge. So the only difference, the mass is the same, kind of um, the spin and some of the other characteristics are the same. The only thing that's different is uh, the charge is positive instead of negative. So that's a positron. Okay. So it's going to produce a positron with beta positive decay, and you're going to get an electron neutrino. So if you remember last time we wrote our V with the line over top for our antineutrino, um, this is just a V with no line over top for our 
electron neutrino. So I've got the beta positive decay of carbon 14. Oops, I erase a bit of that. Eraser. Look at that. So uh, carbon 14 is undergoing uh, beta positive decay. So I get my positron, my electron neutrino, and now I just have to balance this out. I've got uh, one on this side, so I need a five. Five and one is six, plus 14. So we get B for boron in this one. Okay, and it balances out. I can check it across the board here. My carbon was atomic number six. On this side, it's six, and at the top, it's 14. Uh, gamma radiation. Okay, uh, so you'll see a gamma particle look like that. Uh, sometimes we'll see it with the values in front, zero, zero. And we remember we already looked at gamma rays when we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum. And one of the things was they were on the highest energy kind of um, area just below cosmic rays. Um, one of the things that confuses people often is, well, why are we even worrying about this mathematically if it's zero and zero here? Uh, it's the energy that's important for us, okay? As well, a lot of the times in the reactions, gamma radiation is going to be accompanied by beta negative radiation. So you'll find those ones often go together. So if this time we have to write a balanced nuclear equation to describe the emission of beta negative and gamma radiation from a cobalt 60 source. So I start with cobalt 60. If I go and look at my periodic table, where is cobalt, 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 cobalt? Cobalt is atomic number 27. It's giving off a gamma particle. Very exciting, zero and zero. And it's also giving off beta negative. So I have to remember back to my beta negative. Negative one electron plus my anti-neutrino. I'm not even going to write zero, zero. I just know it's a, um, a really small particle here. And I have to make sure it balances out. So those are the three I know. 60 across the top. 27, 0, negative 1. So on the bottom, this has to be 28. 28 plus negative 1 is 27. I go back to my periodic table. What's 28 for its atomic number? And that's nickel. Um, one of the things we do worry about because we're talking about radiation is kind of limiting our exposure. Um, this will show, this graphic on the right shows uh, the difference in kind of um, uh, permeability between alpha, beta, and gamma particles, where alpha particles are stopped by pieces of paper, beta by uh, thicker pieces of wood, and gamma by something like concrete. Okay, it's uh, a lot more high energy um, to work through. Uh, in a way, alpha particles can actually be a bit more dangerous than beta. It depends on the sources, depends on what's happening with it. But one of the things we worry always with any type of radiation is what can we do for our safety? Uh, one of the things is to make sure that we've got the correct safety equipment on. So if we're dealing with gamma radiation, um, we, we've got enough protection uh, in place on our bodies. We've given a lot of distance. A lot of the uh, radiation can be reduced by uh, moving away from it. Um, if we're kind of in a lab setting and you're working with radioactive materials, you want to wear face masks, uh, you want to wear the proper protective equipment. All of that is trying to limit our exposure to ionizing radiation. If you think about uh, some forms of UV that can be ionizing, we want to limit our exposure to the sun, we want to wear sunscreen, we want to avoid tanning booths, um, things like that to kind of reduce our exposure to uh, the radiation around us. Uh, so there's two more uh, types of nuclear reactions, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. These two aren't actually, um, they're not decay reactions, they're kind of their own special types of nuclear reactions. And you've probably heard of them. Nuclear fission is really, really common uh, when it comes to nuclear uh, power plants. So if we talk about generation of uh, energy from power plants. You can think of Homer Simpson here. Where we've got our cooling towers. Okay, um, This is nuclear radiation or nuclear fission. Uh, the biggest thing about reactions like this is they actually split large atoms into smaller atoms. 
that's kind of the key for fission. It's a break. If you can remember, think about the word fission as a as a break. And what will happen is you'll get a neutron here fired at high speed at uh, a really large kind of unstable um, isotope. Often uranium, plutonium is another example. What will happen is this will split the uranium into two different pieces. As well, and what's really important for us, is we actually get three neutrons coming off here. Now, this doesn't just happen once. These three neutrons are going to hit different uranium products or plutonium or whatever your fissionable material is. And that reaction is going to continue. So we're going to get a chain reaction. And very quickly, it's going to um, increase the amount of energy we're given off. One of the really good things about nuclear fission is it gives off way more energy, much, much more energy than any chemical reaction. Okay. So we get a lot of energy out of nuclear fission. Uh, and it's one of the keys for uh, why we why we use nuclear um, because we do have to deal with nuclear waste there is a high cost for starting up um, nuclear fission reactors um, but the amount of energy you get out of it far surpasses anything you get out of uh, um, chemical reactions so if uranium-235 undergoes nuclear fission it's going to produce three neutrons krypton-92 and barium-141 let's write out this equation below so this is our nuclear fission reaction so nuclear fission starts with a neutron hitting a uranium atom, okay? And this time it's giving us all of our products here. So it gives us three neutrons. And I could write out one neutron plus another neutron plus a third neutron. But that gets a bit tedious. So I'm just going to write it kind of how you'll often see it shorthand. So this is our neutrons, and there's three of them. So we've got a big three kind of in front here. Krypton... 92, Krypton is 36, and Barium is atomic number 56, okay? And my um, reactions still have to balance out. So if I look at the left up here, the 1 and 235 need to make 236. If I look over here, I've got three neutrons, so three times one is three, plus 92 and 141. So three plus 92 plus 141, so three and 92 is 95, 95 plus 141 is 236. So 236 equals 236, that checks out. Okay, uh, as well, color can I use here? Let's go dark blue. I've got these ones down here, 0 plus 92. So on my left side, I've got 92 protons. On my right side, I've got 3 times 0 is just 0, plus 36 plus 56 is 92 again. That checks out. So 36 and 56 is 92. This is actually called the conservation of charge at the bottom. This is the conservation of nucleons. We'll talk more about that next time. Uh, finally, we've got our nuclear fusion reactions. These are where we get smaller um, atoms fused together, okay, to form a uh, much larger nucleus uh, or nuclei. Uh, this happens in stars primarily. We can't really do this at scale on Earth. We don't have really large nuclear fusion reactors. It is a possibility, maybe, down the road. Uh, and the nice part about this is this gives off way, way more energy than even fission reactions. So much more than chemical reactions, much more than fission reactions. This would easily solve our energy problem. The tricky thing is you need conditions similar to the inside of stars. So high temperature, high pressure. And we just can't do that at scale on Earth. We can do this in small ways, kind of in the lab. Um, but it's really hard to do kind of on the big scale right now. Okay, so there's maybe a possibility down the line. Maybe not. We're We're... we're trying to figure this out. Okay, so here's an example of one. It's kind of shown on the right over here. So you've got, uh, this is a hypothetical fusion reaction that we might be able to do down the line for um, uh, fu nuclear fusion power plants. So deuteridium and tritium are just examples of hydrogen. So really they're hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3. So they're different isotopes 
of hydrogen. So they will fuse together under enough temperature and pressure. And stuff like this happens in our sun. It happens in the stars all the time. Okay, and form larger atoms. So this is an example of a fusion reaction. Now, if I look over here, what's actually happening, so this is our example of fusion, is this isn't all that stable. So it actually breaks down a bit more. Okay, so it's a little more complicated than I'm just showing here. Because if I did the next step here, the helium-5 breaks down into a more stable helium-4 and a neutron is given off here. Okay, but this top one, this is a clear kind of case of fusion. Okay, we'll talk more uh, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion when I get back. That's it for today.